We will now begin panel discussion two, titled Made in Australia with Japan. So, panelists, please take a seat. The, okay. Please kindly, kindly return to your seats. Yeah. The, the discussion will be moderated by Melanie Brock, CEO of Melanie Brock Advisory. Hello, hello everybody. Can you all do me a favour and grab your sausage rolls and your coffee and take your seats, please? Thank you very much. If you want to get a water, but we'll be about to start soon. Thank you very much. We have the Premier coming very soon, so we're going to be as brief as we possibly can. Yeah, we'll sit where you like, I think. Hello. <laughs> All righty, so has everybody got their coffees? Look at that. Excellent, thank you very much. My name is Melanie Brock and I was just recently introduced to you by Hirose-san as the person who had her 60th birthday, which you don't mind so much in uh, Japan, but I find that people always come up to me, as somebody just did, and said, D did you mind that he told everybody that you were 60? Um, and I don't, so that's completely okay with me. Um, but uh, yes, my name is Melanie Brock, and he today I'm actually here, well, I'm here in many capacities. One is a friend of Nikkei. Um, Arakawa-san and I first met in 2014. Before you were important. Before I was important. <laughs> Before I was 60, <laughs> um, but uh, I had a, um, an association and I've known Kaori and so it's a great pleasure to work with the team in pulling this terrific panel together and as you can see we've got a great uh, group of people to listen to. Um, my um, other hats include uh, today uh, a board member or non-executive director of Asahi Group Holdings which is why you've got all the Asahi water and if you'd like a beer in a minute I will make sure that you have that as well. I'm also on the board of Kawasaki Heavy Industries and Mitsubishi Estate, and for that I have a, an association with both Nicola, Yuzo and Tom before, so thank you very much. The other board I'm on is Sega Sammy, uh, and I cannot play any um, video games whatsoever, so I think I'm the least qualified person to be on that board for many reasons. Um, I know that you will have had the program beforehand, and so you will be able to look through the bios of all of the um, guests that we have today on our panel, but would you join me in welcoming Nicola Wade Field Evans, Mark Woodsford, Yuzo Nishiyama and Andrew, Andrew, who we've just literally met for the very first time. But I think you'll work out that we'll be a good panel together today. Um, one of the questions that uh, we've been asked to address is Australia made uh, in... Well, uh, how, how do we um, further the Australia-Japan relationship in business um, through decarbonisation, through financial markets, through increased investment? And so this group represent a wide um, and a broad uh, range of sectors that I think we'll be able to have a really good discussion today. Uh, building on the discussion that was uh, had just before, looking at innovation as well. Um, we've also been asked to look at ec economic security, which is not natu naturally um, a patch that I... Um, delve into, but as people in business know, economic security is in fact uh, a key part of our business. It's also a major piece of uh, being part in this region. So we're looking at Australia-Japan, Australia-Japan and third countries, how we progress the relationship. But more than anything, as much as we focus on the depth of the Australia-Japan relationship and the importance of that relationship, which was, I think, so um, well described by both Jan Adams um, prior to uh, the beginning of the first session, but through the discussions that um, Arakawa-san and Kaori offered as well, we thought we'd just look at some of the potential challenges and where we need to be a little bit mindful of how we build on that. So, Nicola, I don't know whether I might jump to you straight on that, because Nicola's my old friend and she'll forgive me later. Um, but I thought I'd just ask Nicola, how do you see the sort of current nature, the status of the Australia-Japan relationship and what might be some of those challenges and areas that you think you would change? Thanks, Melanie. And um, I just also want to say thank you to um, the Nikai for um, sort of reconstituting this forum. It's really, really important. I spent a number of years uh, living in Hong Kong and had a long association with the Nikkei um, when I was up there. Um, I and Melanie, I think Melanie knows I'm going to say this. I think the Australian-Japanese relationship is one of the 
strongest, most enduring, but most understated relationship that Australia has, not only from a bilateral country, uh, government to government perspective, but also from a business perspective. So I've been um, working on, um, so I'm an M&A lawyer um, by background and worked um, with a large Australian law firm for a number of years before I became a non-executive director and worked on a number of um, Japanese Australian transactions in that time. And the one thing I would say is that relationship at the business level is getting stronger and stronger. Last year we saw more investment by Japanese companies in Australian companies in a wide variety of sectors across the Australian economy. Um, and you virtually wouldn't know about that because it's not heavily publicised. We're not a relationship where there are tensions and I think that's, that's the most enduring thing about the Australian-Japanese relationship. We just get on and do it. And that would be my experience from nearly 35 years um, working in the business community in Australia and in Asia. It's, and it's one of the things I've loved about working with significant Japanese companies. Um, my colleague Tom has already explained um, how Lend Lease has benefited. But it's not only Lend Lease, it's the property sector uh, all up in Australia is really benefiting from Japanese, significant Japanese investment and also innovative Japanese investment, which is just getting stronger year on year. Um, but I think the thing that I would say is that ch the, the major challenge is just that people really don't know or understand the strength of the relationship. The second challenge I would say is we've got significant Japanese investment in Australia, but it's harder to go the other way. So we're one of the largest energy uh, exporters to Japan. But apart from energy, there are very few Australian companies that have significant Japanese subsidiaries or enterprises. I've been lucky to sit on the boards of two Australian companies that are probably one and two in Japan, and that's Lend Lease, and then I recently retired from the Macquarie board. And Macquarie, like Lend Lease, has had a long history of investing in Japan, but there aren't a lot of other companies, and, and I'm I am del deliberately excluding energy and uh, minerals when I, when I look at that. Well, I'm not going to exclude our good friends at Woodside, but I'm going to jump to the Australian Retirement Trust just to talk a little bit about that flow back into Japan because um, we spoke in our pre-session uh, uh, online chat that we had that was uh, was terrific about some of the sort of focus that your group is now placing in Japan. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think... I think the role of GPIF in the global sense um, has some impact there as well. And so um, Australian Retirement Trust, we have $300 billion in assets under management, which sounds like a lot of money, but you compare that to... Uh, the it is a lot of money. ...to or so trillion dollars that GPIF invests. Uh, we are still sort of competing with them for investment um, in Japan as well. Uh, I think one of the things that's getting increasingly interesting for us is the ability to partner with them. Um, you would have seen they've, they're recently expanding into the unlisted asset space. And I think that's somewhere where um, institutional investors in Australia have a bit of an advantage, um, a longer history in terms of investing in that space. And so increasingly what we're finding is um, investors like GPIF are coming to talk to us and want to learn from us how to invest in that space. That presents a really good opportunity, I think, for us to access more in Japan. Um, I'd say probably for the last five or so years, we've been quite interested at investing more in Japan. Um, We've had a strategic overweight position from an equity investment point of view. Uh, you sort of go back to the three arrow, um, three arrow policy of Abe. Um, I think the first two arrows were relatively easy and the third arrow was really, really hard. Um, we've been, I think, highly convicted in the, I guess, like the, the multi-level sort of strategic view from the um, all levels of Japanese government that they want that to happen. Um, and so for investors like us to provide capital into that is a really good opportunity. So we have been quite heavily invested. We have, I'd say, close to $10 billion of investments in Japan right now, mainly in, list, in the listed space, where I think the exciting thing for us is what can we do more in the unlisted space in Japan. Any challenges that you're sensing that we as a group could work on and solve, help solve? Uh, look, I think uh, for us, the biggest challenge in any overseas market is finding local 
capital that wants to invest alongside us. And so when you're investing into an infrastructure transaction, regulatory risk is one of the biggest risks you worry about. And so having a large domestic investor alongside you is one of your best protections against that. And so I think the number one thing for us is being able to invest alongside and GPIF is the natural um, candidate there. So the more they invest and look to invest in that space, I think the more opportunities open up for us. So some of those deals will be written up in the Nikkei, I would imagine, in the next little while? Correct. There we go. You heard it here. Um, Mark, I was wondering if you could... We spoke a little bit about risk um, and various issues that that do plague uh, the, any relationship, but particularly the Australia-Japan relationship, not in a controversial sense, but just in a we've got to get on top of some of these things. Are you um, comfortable with having that chat now, telling us about your business and how we need to build on it? not sure I have a choice. You uh. ser- and, in fact, you don't. <laughs> Uh, I am. Uh, so first, I'd also like to thank the Nikkei for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, we at Woodside, Japan, our, our organisation would not exist in its current form without the support of the Japanese government, customers, shipping companies, financiers through the whole value chain. Uh, when we look back to Woodside, when we developed the Northwest Shelf Project, that was really underpinned by uh, all of stakeholders throughout that value chain. When we look at the Scarborough Energy Project, uh, which Woodside sanctioned about two years ago, we've brought in JIRA um, into that project. And uh, the word I hate using is customer. They're a partner. So it's a partner in terms of equity participation in the project. It's a partner in terms of LNG offtake. It's a partner in terms of new energy collaboration, and not just within Australia, Australia globally. And then through that partnership, other doors have opened. So Woodside recently announced uh, some JBIC financing for Scarborough with $1 billion from JBIC. 400 or so million dollars from the Japanese commercial banks. So the success of our company has been very much underpinned by quality long-term relationships with Japanese counterparties and, and that's something we are very grateful at the Woodside. Uh, when we look at the last you know, 18 months to two years, I mean one of the, I mean we touched upon this when we talked offline, one of, one of the issues that has popped up a little bit in the discussions we've had on the energy front with Japanese is sovereign risk. Uh, and one of the concerns has been as Australia, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've lived in Japan, I've worked in Japan for a long time, I've never heard those two words in a sentence uh, throughout my entire career up until about two years ago. Uh, and there was a cumulative effect of a number of things that were driving, I think, a level of uncertainty and the dependence that Japan has upon Australian energy. I mean, LNG, Australian LNG supplies 40% of Jap- Japan's uh, LNG. We had uh, former Ambassador Yamagami son come and speak to the Woodside leadership team and he said, thank you, you keep the lights on in Shibuya. Um, And so I think the uncertainty that was created through not necessarily one thing, but a number of small things uh, did rock rock the relationship a little bit. Now, I think that has changed and we're on a pathway to improvement. I think the government's future gas strategy that was announced earlier this year has been an extremely positive development about the essential role of natural gas, not just in the short, medium, but also longer term energy mix, not just here in Australia, but also in the region. And so I think, I think Tom, you mentioned, you know, the relationships do go through ups and downs, both on personal level, uh, organisational level, but also on country to country level. I think we are on the pathway uh, of a very strong relationship coming better, but we do need to recognise the last 18 months, there has been some challenges. And you would think that uh, some of the recent uh, sort of like my bilateral discussions and and uh, increased sort of dialogue between Australia and Japan through business and maybe even in the energy space in the future, some kind of sort of framework by which we can do that. I know the government has a number of um, opportunities for people to do that, but bis- a business-led sort of reset uh, in, th- in that sort of discussion uh, might be something that would um, alleviate some of those areas of, of concern. Yeah, I think I just would like to state that the relationship is in a very, very good level. Um, so, uh, but what happened was there was a little bit of a chink and I think that, that got people a little bit nervous. Uh, but when we look at the importance of bilateral trade between Australia and Japan, the financing uh, that's, that I just mentioned, I mean, that is as strong as ever. Uh, but we do need to recognise every now and then there's going to be some hiccups. And uh, notwithstanding the importance of the strategic relationship that underpins a lot of that work too. Yuzo, did you want to speak about um, our company um, and the work that we've been doing here and how that capital flow has uh, re- increased opportunities for partnership in Australia? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you, Nikki team, for having me today. And I, f- and I feel really fortunate uh, sharing a session with a newly reborn Melanie today. So, 
Um, so we as Mitsubishi Estate are uh, doing a business in Osho more than 10 years now. And yeah, I mean, you know, obviously we have our biggest expo exposure in Japan, but we have been actively expanding our business globally and Osho becoming one of the key focus for us in our, in our organization. And, you know, we have been particularly active over the past three years, and we have now capital committed to Australia, close to $2 billion equity. And the reason why we have been very active is that, you know, we have established office in Sydney three years ago, and we have been partnering with uh, really capable and, you know, financially, financially stable partners like Lentlease and others. And we have been really fortunate position to have a really good opportunities uh, partnering with them. And, you know, Again, we have been investing a lot, but now we are seeing a lot of interest from the Japanese capital as well. But one of the you know, challenge that we are seeing is that, as you guys mentioned, now we have, I mean, there's a foreign tax surcharge, additional you know, surcharge that we have, been, we have to pay as a uh, overseas capital, and also some other tax policy challenges that we have to go through. So that's something that we have to get ahead around, but, in general, there's a big, uh, really good interest from Japanese capital size. So we just need to kind of, you know, put the money coming to Australia uh, in like more friendly. We have to kind of, you know, provide more friendly, um, you know, destination for them to invest in Australia. And so some of the um, property development that you've been doing, it's not just all commercial top end of town, is it? Uh, no, uh, so we have been actively, I mean, you know, investing into commercial office, industrial, but I think the biggest focus at the moment is uh, anything residential. You know, we had really, you know, strong interest from the Japanese capital side for the build to rent, but again, there's a little, you know, tax challenges and policy challenges in that sector. So I think that interest from Japanese capital kind of shifting to the uh, build to sell sector. And we, I was in Japan last week and we, I had a lot, multiple meetings with the Japanese capital and there's a really, really strong demand you know, for them to invest into build to sell residential. Yeah, thank you. So Andrew, with all of that, um, the flow this way, that surely helps the discussions that you're having in that it highlights some of the areas of potential um, investment and, and the growth that's here for those Japanese funds. It, do we just need to be doing more of that? What else do we need to be doing? Uh, look, I think um, I, I think one of the if if I think about what makes it hard for us to invest in Japan, if I think a little hard, a little more about that, one of the challenges I think is that I guess that the corporate culture and the, the at the listed market level like that. The, so the the focus on improving return on equity and shareholder outcomes has been really beneficial to us and feeling like we can engage more in that market. Um, and so, I mean, one of the challenges really is both Australia and Japan are large capital exporters. We have huge pension fund systems and so it's almost like we're fighting with each other for investment at times and to some extent partnering up and looking outside and putting that capital to work to go somewhere else is something that we need to think about and that is something that we actually do spend time talking to someone like GPIF about is being an investor like us in the world. It is a huge world to go out and invest in. Um, the comment about um, housing, I mean, as someone who lives in New South Wales, build to rent, build to own, build to rent to own, doesn't matter, someone just needs to build, right? Like, there is a supply challenge here, um, and so any capital coming into New South Wales to build housing and solve the supply problem is something that I think is really beneficial. Um, certainly something we're very focused on as well, is how can we help to alleviate some of the supply challenges yeah. that we face here. Now, Nicola's not going to appreciate the fact that I'm going to throw a question about corporate governance to her, but um, some of you will have seen in Nicola's bio, she's the chair of the 30% Club. Um, and Nicola is a commentator in um, media and a uh, range of fora um, about the need for uh, better corporate governance. And I know you've been watching the Japan story um, quite closely, um, but vis-a-vis -vis Australia, how does that sit? So, um, thank you, Melanie, for the question. Uh, look... I would say what's been really interesting to me is um, up until about sort of eight to ten years ago, it was very hard to talk to the listed sector in Japan about corporate governance. Um, the stock exchange, the listed companies, the government, I think we're all quite happy with how um, Japanese company, listed companies were, were run and operated. However, post the GFC, 
the conversation changed and it changed globally. It changed in, in most jurisdictions. Where I've done a lot of work, as Melanie knows, is increasing gender diversity in senior leadership roles in Australian listed companies and I'm pleased to say that Australia has led the world in increasing the number of female directors in our top ASX listed companies based on targets, not quotas. And we've had a fantastic and fascinating dialogue with Japan. So we, we're part of a global movement. Japan is part of the 30% Club movement. And just on the diversity side alone, there's been some really interesting conversations. The fact that you as a non-Japanese person are on several listed companies as a non-executive director is an, is an example of how quickly Japan has gone up the chain on corporate governance. And it's not only in diversity, it's in stewardship, it's in how the companies are operated, it's in how they conduct um, themselves, it's the separation between boards and management. I think, I think Japan has, has, has looked at con con countries like Australia, the UK, um, Canada, Com countries that do quite well on corporate governance and started to just quietly, again it's this quietness around what Japan does, just quietly innovated in that space. And you're not going to see a big bang on this in Japan, but you are going to see year on year significant change in corporate governance, which I think is just frankly remarkable. It has really changed and I um, I know that we can't rest on our laurels, as it were, um, and it's um, incumbent of all of those who are on the boards and or um, have a say uh, to ensure that the uh, number of women in management positions, in senior management positions, um, is increased and that the number of women uh, are supported, like a greater number of women are supported in terms of developing the skills necessary to take those roles and to make sure that the structural changes are in place to, to ensure or childcare and the like. Um, but I do know that uh, one of the other changes that we all have noted is this shift to uh, obviously the targets that were set by the, um, one of the previous Prime Ministers, um, Suga, um, in terms of decarbonisation and Japan's carbon neutrality and the focus on sustainability. And that would be something, Mark, that you have seen over your time at, at Woodside, but particularly since you lived in Japan, uh, which was around the time of the um, earthquake, wasn't it? The Great Eastern Earthquake. Yeah. How does that change the discussion and the nature of your investments and the like, or partnerships? Yeah, I mean, I think when you, I mean, I was, I was there on the day of the earthquake and, and, and living there in the period immediately after. And one of the things that really impressed me about the Japan energy mix was the resilience of a portfolio of energy supplies, be it nuclear, be it fossil fuel, be it renewable, etc., such that when I lived in Japan, and I know there was a lot of hardship that happened post-earthquake, so I don't want to understate that for a moment, I never had a single blackout. Um, and that was driven by obviously the behavioural changes of Japanese uh, in terms of reducing demand consumption, but also the fact that they had a suite or a portfolio of energy sources um, that allowed them to uh, deal with obviously a significant natural disaster. And I think there's a lot that can be learned from an economy like Australia. When you look at Japan, which is going to be arguably agnostic as to what the energy source it's going to bring in, it's going to be looking at, well, how do I manage carbon? How do I manage reliability? How do I manage affordability? And how do you structure an energy system such that it can be resilient, such that when you lose one of your uh, energy sources being nuclear, which was around 20% of their portfolio, the economy still functioned. And don't get me wrong, there were some difficulties, but it continued to thrive. Um, so I think when we look at, I mean, I think there's a lot to be learned both ways when you look at the debate that we're having in Australia about how our energy systems will look in the years to come. Look at some of these economies where they don't have the, the benefit of an Indigenous uh, resource base um, to underpin. Um, but for us as an organisation, when we look at the future for Japan, uh, we want to be very much market-led. So we are, we are driven by what our customers ultimately say they want. Um, Japan is driving towards uh, increasingly to decarbonise their economy. Um, LNG is going to be a critical part of that, but also Woodside and our Japanese partners are looking at the suite of other uh, opportunities to help Japan decarbonise, whether it be through CCS, uh, ammonia and hydrogen. Uh, the challenges that we have at the moment fundamentally come down to cost. Um, these sources uh, can achieve the objective, of course, of uh, reducing emissions over time, but they come at a substantial additional cost. And this is where we need to be working collaboratively, again, through the value chain. And this is not just in Australia and Japan. Some of our partnerships with Japanese counterparties are outside of Australia as well. 
um, to ultimately drive the most cost competitive solutions um, to achieve those objectives. Yeah. It's obviously a, a cost is, is the, the major issue, but with that political push behind that to, to achieve the, the targets and, and, and but I, you know, I hear so much more about social licence, obviously here in Australia, um, but it is a big discussion around boardroom tables in Japan, how, how difficult it will become. But the, of course, as everybody knows, with our energy security levels at Nat, what are they, 11 or 12% for Australia? Damien will tell me. 12 for, for Japan and 300 something for Japan. Um, so with that um, incredible difference in terms of just simply how an organisation has to look at its energy uh, sector and the mix means that new forms of energy have to be discussed, don't they? It's just something that is inevitable in that, yeah. Yeah, no, I would just add, I mean, you know, look at some of the things the Japanese government which are doing, which is to enable markets. So there's a, a contract for difference process that's currently, uh, well, I think will be imminently announced, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in relation to help facilitate the development of a cost-competitive ammonia business. Um, and co ammonia, of course, when used uh, to co-fire power stations, can hopefully uh, reduce emissions whilst also maintaining affordability and also um, um, reliability of those facilities. So the role of the Japanese government in helping develop those markets is very important. I'll just tell you a tiny story related to Asahi, um, only because I know they've sponsored the beer today but, uh, and the water. Um, but uh, um, in one of my early board meetings, um, which was uh, just, I've only been on the board since March, and uh, we have these sort of updates about new, um, well, t you know, market developments and the like. And something that Asahi has been working on is a new vending machine. And uh, I mentioned this the other day, and it's quite cute, so I'll tell it again. But it's it's called Shio Tsu or Tabiru Jihanki. So basically, it's a t it's a vending machine that um, actually chomps up CO2. So it's a it's aiming to be a net zero vending machine because of the power. And Mark and others who lived in Japan at the time of the earthquake will remember they actually dimmed the lights on the vending machines in deference to the people in Tohoku and and others who were suffering as a result of the power um, supply um, or other at least to discuss it. So basically what happens with these vending machines is, is that as you um, buy your, you know, whatever, uh, your tea or whatever you're buying at the vending machine, it opens the, the lid up, at, well, the, the, the access point, and then the CO2 is captured by these small CCS blocks of whatever, and uh, a, a building company comes along and retrieves those every two or three weeks as and when is required and, and then builds that out into the um, building materials and goes to the bottom of the building development. So what do you think, Yuzo? Do you think we should have some Asahi Mitsubishi Estate collaboration here? Why not? What Why about not? vending machines all over? And yeah, just because I love Sega Sammy as well, I asked them to take one of the vending machines in the um, the employee's cafeteria and now it's got Sonic being prepared to Sonic the Hedgehog pictures all over it. So it's all about collaboration, isn't it, people? But in any case, what do you think? But no, I'm not going to ask Mitsubishi Estate to take a hold <laughs> blade of vending machines, but I will keep pushing it. But I do know in the building, in the the property sector, uh, the issue of sustainability and decarbonisation is a major piece of discussion. So maybe you can talk a little bit about some of that. I know that Tom mentioned it before. In well, I, I think, you know, obviously we are listed a company in Japan, right? So, I mean, we definitely have to pay a lot of attention to, you know, decarbonisation, ESG, all that kind of stuff. In Australia, we are very fortunate that we have partners like, you know, Land Lease, you know, who cares maybe more than we do, uh, you know, as a listed company. Did I hear you just say so, that? No, but I mean, like... <laughs> But I, I can like, but I can fully, much as much. I can fully rely on you know you know credible partners and you know, trusted partners like Landlease and others to you know do you know everything we can do in our capacity to achieve the highest you know environment friendly you know the building. So yeah, yeah it's re working really well for us. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? That partnership piece too. I was got the um. Some of the discussion, well, we were asked to talk about Made in Australia with Japan. And I think, Andrew, you've talked about the importance of partners and how GPIF will uh, no doubt become a very, uh, an increasingly important um, partner for yourselves. How do you build up your workforce to be better uh, sort of aligned with some of the issues that a Japanese 
fund might be looking for or what they're looking to focus on. Um, we've all seen the need for greater sort of Asia literacy, but I um, I know we sp uh, at last week at the Asia Society, I think Anthony might still be here, um, but the uh, session we had at the AFR um, talking about Asia literacy, it's, it's quite shocking that we're still even having to have that conversation, quite frankly. Um, but you must be building up some of the skills within your work force to sort of get more Japan ready? Um, so, um, so we primarily hire domestically, so we don't have offshore teams um, in any particular reason. We've just recently opened an office in the UK to get closer to deal flow. But one of the benefits, I think, of being in the region is we're actually in the time zone. And so we do spend a lot of time traveling up there. I haven't traveled overseas for since COVID, um, it's a dirty secret. But so I haven't actually been traveling, but plenty of members of my team have. We're actually planning a trip to Japan in the next sort of month or so. Um, I do remember, um, was it five years ago? My last trip away was to Japan, actually. Um, and we spent took that time to meet with all levels of government because I think it's not just going to meet with a company or um, having people come to you. You have to go on the ground if you want to really understand what's going on in a region. We actually have a dedicated team in our real estate team that are focused just on Asian real estate. Um, and so that team is focused in that area. We have teams within the organisation just focused on partnerships with other funds. And so those people are focused just on those relationships with those other funds. And so we try and use partnerships really, um, really sort of diligently. And so we have a range of external managers that we partner with. We want on the ground partners to get those investments to happen. And so I think it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a conglomerate of all of those different factors. Um, I think one of the benefits I think of a generation that has grown up being a part of Asia basically here. Um, so I'm actually surprised that Asian literacy is something that needs to be so um, oh. focused on. I mean, yeah. So I, I grew up through the first Japanese, like the original Japanese boom. And so, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I grew up in Coffs Harbour. There's an international golf course there that was built um, by the Japanese. It's a fantastic golf course. If you ever come, you should really take the time to get Is to Coffs Harbour. invitation to all of us? Yeah, that's right. Bonville International Golf Course, if you've never been, it's fantastic. I think that's really important, not just literacy, but uh, one of the um, uh, discussions that we had last night over fantastic um, Sydney oysters with the Nikkei team was how do we uh, raise the profile of Australia in not only the Japanese uh, in the Nikkei Shimbun, but obviously through Nikkei Asia for our partners in um, the Indo-Pacific, but also how we um, get more information. Like simply, I think, who, who was it? Uh, oh, Hirose's son said Joho. And, um, and people to people connections. So information and more discussion between people at people to people level. And I think it's really important that, uh, I know the, uh, we won't talk about other media organisations, but uh, we do have uh, in Japan, uh, the Fin Review and also the ABC. But there's, I, I think we need a bigger push uh, in terms of what we write about, because knowing more about Japan's sort of challenges, um, will to Jan's earlier point, um, help that discussion about what people know about Australia's modern challenges as well. Nicola, I know you're a big fan and push for Asian language and you're waiting for the Premier to be here so we could tell him as well, perhaps? I was. I was going <laughs> <gonna, laughs> to look him in the eye around why, why are we de degrading and devaluing um, uh, Asian languages? And it's not only a New South Wales issue, and it's, a, it's an Australian issue. Um, I also grew up in, a, in an environment where um, Japanese was the language to learn if you didn't want to learn a European language and that seems to have fallen away and we need to build this – is, this is an issue for our young people in order to survive in a global workforce because they're part of a global workforce, we need to have better – they need to have better language capability and that's dual language. Um, and there are, I think, a handful of languages that should be compulsory from the age of five in this country. And Japanese, I've, I've said this publicly before, Japanese should be one of them. And the reason for that is Japan is such an important partnership for Australia, but it provides fantastic um, opportunities for not only young people. When I, um, when Japan Post took over the toll holding, t took over toll holdings. Melanie told me to go to the University of New South Wales Languages School and do a year of Japanese to refresh my Japanese because I was then going to be on a oh, Japanese yes. board. <laughs> no, Melanie tells. <laughs> but it was a fantastic idea because 
the um, executives from the chairman down at Japan Post were so impressed that I'd taken the time to do that. And I was actually surprised about how quickly my Japanese language skills came back after a hiatus of a number of years. But it's those sort of things. It's not only for our young people. I think there's a lot we could learn both ways. And the statistic in the pre in one of the opening um, conversations about the we're only getting 300,000 Japanese people coming here. I think part of that is that we don't sort of welcome – well, it's not welcome – we don't have the structures to support – Japanese travelling here like we used to in the 80s and 90s. So I think we need to go back and rethink how we can attract, how we can make Australia an attractive place, not only for Japanese tourists but Japanese students and Japanese business people to, to actually move here and spend some time working here. I know the JABCC and the AJBCC have worked very hard to build the Future Leaders Program to be a key part of the of the relationship. And we have a number of future leaders here in the room. They might put their hand up. There we go. We've got a couple at least. I can, there were a couple before. Yeah, there we go. See? And it's – yeah, good. Thank you. It's terrific to see this – I'm not, I'm not going to make them speak. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though. Um, but I think it's um, it's special for the business associations to be supporting the uh, future leaders. Um, it's important for us to take the new Colombo plan students back into our groups. And I'm sure um, that that helps not only the academic um, sort of associations continue, but it, it really does help our businesses. Um, our newly appointed chair of the Australia Japan Foundation, Natsuko Ogawa, um, will also be no doubt through the foundation be looking at how we the, the government's uh, support of students is continued. But how do we bring them into the workforce and how do we give them a role? And I know that Woodside has a, 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 like a range of um, overseas markets, global markets that you work with and your J Japan team is um, second to none in terms of the expertise. But it's really focusing on building that next, lev next generation, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we do and, uh, is with an, a number of Japanese utilities, we have staff exchange programs. Uh, and it's the quickest thing that two CEOs agree to is can we have some of Woodside folk go and work, uh, well, not work, uh, spend a month uh, in, a, in a Japanese utility and, and it's reciprocated. And I myself did it. So with, I mean, at Hirose Sun's organisation, Tokyo Gas, I spent a month with them in 2005. And lo and behold, a couple of years later, I said I wanted to move to Japan. I don't think there was any, uh, any there, there's a clear nexus between the two. But it gave me the ability to get into the organisation. So I, one of the things that I was quite inquisitive was to understand about how Japanese HR works. Um, so actually to sit down with the HR department and at least get some level of appreciation. Could you tell me later? <laughs> yeah, it's a work in progress. Uh, but... But and, and, and then what happens is, is that those folk who do the staff exchanges are generally re relatively junior when they do it, and then 20 years later, all of a sudden, they're starting to pop up and be pretty senior folk in organisations. Uh, and you go back and say, oh, we met, it. we met 20 years ago, and all of a sudden, that enables you to do other things. So, and we have staff exchange programs, I think now, with five Japanese utilities. So every, every year, we will send some people there, and then or every second year, and then every second year, they send people down to our facilities gives you exposure to things like, I would never have gone to a nuclear power station uh, but for a staff exchange or a hydroelectric facility, the Kurobe uh, uh, hydroelectric facility, but for the staff exchanges. Um, but also, we are not shy from saying there is, and it really uh, really came to fruition through COVID when travel was, pro was not permitted, was the personal relationships and face-to-face -face relationships. So, you have to spend a lot of time on a plane. Uh, you have to go to Japan a lot and Japanese have to come to Australia a lot to build those strong, deep personal relationships. And if you look at the deals that we did with JIRA and LNG Japan, they all kicked off during COVID and they were all built upon relationships that had been established not just years, decades before. So can't undervalue and can't underestimate the, the role of those, those interpersonal exchanges. 
Well, I know um, Yuzo, you're quite often on a plane um, and that you've just recently joined the AJBCC and Mitsubishi Estate has also joined JABCC. So, I mean, that's it, it shows just the importance of these business groups. But um, you have a big te a bigger team here now um, and they come from a, a range of different backgrounds um, and having been seconded to a range of different uh, markets. You yourself studied in the US, but surely you love Australia the most now. I do. You were a bit slow there. <laughs> That was a little delayed, I thought, <laughs> in any case. Tell us about the team and the work that they do here. Uh, so our team in Australia, compared to you know, other global locations that we have office, is a really re relatively young team. I mean, I myself, I mean, being in the mid-40s is very unique you know, compared to our other kind of business head in overseas you know, offices that we have globally. Uh, but I think that's a, our competitive advantage in this market, you know, just being, you know, energetic, being nimble, you know, really quick, you know, making decisional kind of stuff. And that's why I think we ha we could have built a lot of, you know, good relationships with the local partners. And having the different backgrounds is really important because, I mean, if you're working for a Japanese company, you tend to have some time, very kind of narrow-minded uh, perspective. But, you know, having, you know, being young, having a, a lot of different backgrounds, you know, gives you a, a lot more kind of objective perspective to look at the same thing. So, yeah, it, it is really working really well. And we just, you know, being young and just being very active in communication helps us make the kind of healthy decisions when we, you know, try to make an investment in Australia. So, yeah, it's really working really for us, well for us, yeah. And also karaoke is a big part of the team um, sport, I imagine, in many places. Yeah, obviously, yes. <laughs> I mean, we go out with our partners to karaoke multiple occasions, you know, to celebrate, you know, any kind of milestone that we have achieved. So, you know, and Tom is a regular for our karaoke <laughs> sessions. So. Australia-Japan collaboration through music. Okie dokie. Well, I have, um, we've got five minutes left and I thought even though the poor panellists have had not been asked any of the questions that I said I would ask uh, during our pre-briefing. I'm going to ask you, what about Australia would you like to see the Nikkei Shimbun people cover in newspapers in the future? This is a job for our trusty um, Wes Imahashan. But in any case, what do you think we should be telling our Japanese readers, our colleagues in uh, Nikkei readers in Japan about Australia now? Do you want more about superannuation systems and the benefit of those? Do you want more about what you're doing, Mark? Do you, what do you want? What would be the most important thing for your business to be further developed uh, in terms of understanding in Japan? Um, well, I'm going to go first on that unscripted question. Sorry um, So if I, if I could think of one thing that would be beneficial from our perspective, uh, it would be... I, I, we sort of spoke a little about the corporate governance, but I guess like the reflection of like corporate governance, what what is good about corporate governance in Australia that Japanese companies and corporates could learn from? I think that would be probably the number one thing because for us, that's the number one, that would be the number one tailwind for us investing more and more in Japan. That's excellent. I hope somebody at Nikkei Shimbun is writing this all down. Yoroshiko onegaishimasu. Okay, Yuzo. Yeah, I think from the media coverage perspective, I think... Uh, there, I think there has been a lot of focus in like energy and defense sectors. But again, as I said uh, in the earlier, there's a really, really strong demand from the Japanese capital side to invest into property sector at the moment. So, but one of the challenges for them to, you know, considering when they consider investment is that they, because of the lack of the information, they cannot really get ahead around, you know, what is the right opportunity for them to invest and what is the right timing for them to invest. So, yeah, if we can have more coverage from the, you know, property sector perspective, that would be very, very much appreciated, I think. There we go. All right, I'm going to try and address a couple of problems here. Uh, we don't have a direct flight between Perth and Tokyo. Except uh, for ANA's ANA's flight. got a seasonal flight. Uh, it is a real inhibitor. <laughs> To, it, is, it, is a, it is an inhibitor to business uh, and also I think uh, if we want to get those tourism statistics a little bit more even, uh, I would love to see the awareness such that we see, whether it be JAL, a a Qantas or whoever it wants to be, a direct flight between Perth and Tokyo all year round. I fully support that. Nicola. Thanks, Melanie. I'm going to pick up something that um, Mimi said in the previous session. I would like to see more discussion around what 
Japanese companies are actually doing, and that is um, financing Australia's transition in the car in reducing carbon. So we are seeing fantastic Japanese investment from the f the Japanese finance sector right across um, the renewable energy space. So they are investors in major renewable projects. They're investors in innovation at our universities. They're investors that, that, that they are popping up all over the place in the transition. And I think that's a really important um, sort of almost unsung part of the relationship. Excellent. Well, we're at time now and we have a very special guest who has just arrived. So I would like to ask you to join me in thanking Nicola Wakefield Evans, Ma Mark Abbotsford, Andrew Fisher and Yuzo Nishiyama for their great insights and ideas about what's next. Thank you. Thanks, Ted.